and so we proceed to the third of my videos giving you kind of general background on what and where is medieval Scandinavia, what's going on there, how does it fit in. Um, and we've talked about the kind of geographical diversity of the place, um, yet yeah, also its cultural unity. We've talked a bit about the Viking period and, and how it sees this massive expansion of Scandinavian people and culture, um, both with colonies and, and with other kinds of cultural contacts more widely. Um, and I haven't got into too much detail, but hopefully you've got a general picture there. Ninth century to the 11th. Um, what I'd like to bring us on to is um, partly a set of concepts, really, as well as a kind of general chronology, which I've put under this heading, Christianity Cause or Symptom of Change. And I think I'll pause on this slide for a bit and sort of chat about some of the issues that that involves. And I, I won't have any simple answers, I don't think. If, if I have any answers at all, I may have some complex answers. Um, and uh, having set up those issues, which are going to keep echoing um, in reading medieval Icelandic literature, um, I'll then move on to a bit of kind of chronology and, and sort of political history. Um, let, let's start with um, some basic concepts about, about medieval Christianity. Um, in the Viking Age, Scandinavia is basically a non-Christian place. Um, I say non-Christian and let, let's kind of unpack that first. Um, it's very common um, to draw a dichotomy between Christians and pagans and lots of different cultural groups are interested in doing that. Medieval Christians are interested in doing that because they want to define Christendom as being distinct from um, a, everyone else, a bunch of pagans and they're very keen on kind of creating a, a sort of pagan I identity, an image of the pagan. Um, and, and, and the idea that paganism is somehow a coherent and distinctive cultural phenomenon different from Christianity. Uh, and modern scholars have kind of inherited that terminology and you'll see people talking about from paganism to Christianity and that kind of thing an awful lot. Even I do it from time to time. Um, and, and of course uh, in, in the 20th century and 21st century there are even sections of Western society um, that identify themselves as pagans and so the idea of a kind of distinctive pagan identity has been sort of taken up by those groups of people and, 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 has, and a distinctive pagan identity has been created by them um, and as with sort of certain ideas that there's a kind of cultural coherence to paganism. And this just won't work at all for understanding what's going on in early medieval Europe. For all the people are welcome to be pagans now, I don't mind. Um, Instead, we can much more productively think about um, traditional and innovative culture. Um, medieval Scandinavians who converted to Christianity um, and considered themselves Christians were part of Christian, Christendom, were baptised, thought that the Pope was basically you know, in charge of what was going on in, in, in their um, religious lives, um, could nonetheless have all sorts of beliefs that we don't see um, in our kind of post-Reformation world. Um, as fitting into orthodox Christianity. It's very tempting to talk about beliefs that don't seem orthodox to us as being, well, unorthodox, or um, superstitions, pagan superstitions, that kind of thing. Um, indeed, our medieval texts do that, and obviously that, the, the decision of those authors needs to be respected and understood um, and interpreted. But at the same time, we can understand that actually Christianity is not monolithic. There's all sorts of variety in Christianity, um, both now and in the past, and all sorts of people with enormously differing ideas consider themselves to be Christians. And as scholars sort of objectively trying to understand how people in the past understood their world, it's not very helpful, if, uh, helpful for us to sort of say, well, these ones are proper Christians and these ones aren't. What's important is that they thought they were Christians, and it's important for us to objectively try to understand what Christianity entailed for them and what their belief systems were. Um, so, uh, so we don't want to get too dogmatic about what Christianity is. Um, okay, so we, we've got this concept of Christianity floating and we've got the concept floating that Scandinavia is converting to Christianity during this period. Um, rather than thinking of that as being a conversion from paganism to Christianity, we can think rather in terms of Scandinavians having a bunch of beliefs to which they then add Christian ideas. And those Christian ideas come in addition to their old beliefs. They will change some of their old beliefs 
Um, some of their previous belief systems will change, and some of their previous belief systems will stay the same. Um, from both the mundane to how you build a ship, to um, perhaps much more kind of um, culturally distinctive ones, like how you go about healing, um, how you envisage uh, the supernatural threats in the world. Um, pagan gods, as it were, and the old gods, characters like Thor and Odin, um, don't disappear when you adopt belief in Christianity. And, and even in Rome, people probably, at least a good number of them, probably thought that Thor and Odin were probably real. Um, that, that, that wasn't really um, in doubt. Um, but they've gone from being potentially the good guys to being bad guys, and then will get fitted into Christian, Christian mythology in various ways as demons um, and so forth. Um, so, so we're getting a lot of transition in culture and belief. But a lot of that transition um, won't fit into a kind of Christian versus pagan model. Innovative versus traditional is often more helpful. And then developing that idea onto this idea of Christianity as a cause or a symptom of change. Um, the people who write our texts, our medieval texts, are Christians. And um, uniformly, um, once we get past the Viking Age with, with its runic inscriptions... Um, and not only are they Christians, but they're usually professional Christians in the sense of being um, monks or priests. Um, some people might get uncomfortable with the concept of a professional Christian, but there we go. I, I, I find, find it quite a useful concept. Um, so, so they will have a particular uh, set of ideas about Christianity. And one of the key ideas is that Christianity is one of the most important things in the world. And they write about it in those terms, um, or often at, at any rate. Um, and that's fine, they're welcome to do it, and, and it's an important cultural phenomenon that they do, and worth studying and understanding. Um, but at the same time, it might actually be that Christianity is much more a symptom than a cause of change. And I'll see if I can unpack that a bit. Um, but first, let's give us, get a bit of a narrative in position about how conversion happened and when it happened, and then we can kind of come back and unpack, well, hang on, is this a cause or a symptom? All right, let's get on to the next slide then. Um, here's a little bit of a chronology of uh, conversion. Um, Denmark kicks it off um, in the 960s with a king called Harald der Gormsson. Um, characteristically, Denmark is further south than the rest of Scandinavia and is therefore more closely in contact with um, Christian Europe. Um, I don't think I'll unpack too many of the details of that process. Um, not at this precise moment anyway. Um, and, and these rune stones um, both reflect those raised by Harald. This is a picture of um, the actual stone that he has. And you can see this amazing image of uh, Christ being crucified, um, carried out in this fantastic 10th century Scandinavian um, carved style. And this is the reverse of the same stone, if I remember rightly. Or maybe it's another one next to it. Oh dear. Never mind. Um, and the painting is modern, but it does actually ref reflect the uh, decoration that these stones would have had in the medieval period. And that's very important to understand. It, it, these were really kind of bright and distinctive artefacts. Um, and you have this uh, fantastic inscription that's kind of relating aspects of, of, of the story of how he converted and therefore, as king, converted Denmark. Um, Norway uh, goes over to Christianity after some kind of toing and froing. Um, in the vicinity of uh, the late 10th century, under King Olaf Tryggvason, uh, now Saint Olaf, uh, a violent and bloodthirsty character, if ever there was one. Um, and so he converts Norway to Christianity. Iceland comes in 999, stroke 1000, we're not quite sure which. Um, largely under pressure from Olaf, um, but there are various other factors in play. Um, it wasn't a violent conversion, unusually. Um, it, it was taken by a kind of collective... Uh, decision of, of uh, Iceland's aristocrats. Sweden, it's really hard for us to tell what was going on. Um, they produced very few texts um, even after they convert to Christianity. Um, we know that uh, at least one Christian missionary went to Sweden in the 9th century, so they've been in contact with Christianity even on kind of native soil, let alone going abroad and then coming home um, for a very long time. Um, but equally, we've got fairly clear evidence for plenty of um, non Christian ritual activity, as you might say, um, and sort of unconverted people, people who didn't think of themselves as Christians, easily in the 11th century. Um, so um, 
it's very hard to tell precisely what processes were afoot in Sweden. Um, so, so conversion to Christianity is quite a messy process, quite a long process, different stages in different places at different times. Um, and we can draw a distinction quite helpfully between conversion to Christianity, the moment at which a person says, hey, I'm a Christian, and Christianization, which is a much kind of longer process. Conversion, you can say, is kind of a, a moment at which you change identity, whereas Christianization is a much more kind of broad cultural process. You can undergo Christianization without converting, and it's fair to say that Scandinavia was undergoing Christianization for a very long time as um, Vikings came into contact with Christian cultures and, and came into contact with the ideas that were associated with them. And likewise, Christianization can keep going on for a long time after conversion, both for an individual and for a society, for centuries. I mean, the Reformation, uh, which happens in the 17th century, so, you know, well, in most places um, in, in the um, 16th and 17th centuries, um, is, you know, a good four or five hundred years um, after, or 600 years even, after some of the uh, conversions of Scandinavian countries. Um, and in a way, the Reformation is a kind of st a massive stage in Christianization. So Christianization was still ongoing and, and, and very gradual. Um, and if you look around the world today, at the, the people who consider themselves to be Christians, you could well kind of think, well, you know, you could probably stick a little closer to the precepts of Jesus Christ than you actually do. Um, so Christianization is a very complex, varied, open-ended, woolly, problematic process and is a very useful concept to distinguish from conversion, a change of identity. Okay, so these different uh, kings and different regions kind of adopt Christianity officially um, at these times. How does that then play out um, in, in the wider history of Scandinavian culture? Oh, just to add in uh, another iconic image of uh, medieval uh, Scandinavian Christianity, this time from Norway, a stave church. Um, oh, amazing, amazing wooden architecture and perhaps giving us some hint of the secular wooden architecture that's been lost. In any case, um, let, let's get a little bit of a narrative uh, in position. Um, if you're going to be a Christian in the medieval period, you're going to have to have a bishop. And the political ramifications of that are potentially very strong. Um, ecclesiastical rule was separate from secular rule, but um, a king that was keen to kind of colonise a particular area or ex extend his power over a particular area would do well to get a friendly bishop running that area first, while sort of pretending that he didn't have any colonial ambitions in mind himself for his secular authority, um, and, and, and therefore kind of build up um, the mechanisms of power that he could then exploit later. And so we see a lot of competition uh, for different kind of kings and kingdoms to get bishoprics as those kingdoms themselves come into shape. Um, back to our map of uh, Scandinavia, um, in say the 8th century for sure, all of this region, um, well, Iceland's not even on the map in the 8th century, all of this region um, involves a kind of patchwork of, of petty uh, chiefdoms, small polities, um, rulers whose power wanes and, and, and waxes, um, and nothing that we could really call kingdoms. The Viking Age sees a massive consolidation of power within different regions of Scandinavia, as chieftains basically start to extend their authority more and more over their neighbours, and eventually establish themselves as kings and establish kingdoms. Um, that's partly funded by the money that's coming in from Viking activities. Um, so there's an economic dimension there. Um, ideologically, it's partly supported by things like Christianity in lots of different ways. And also, um, not just ideologically, but kind of technically supported by Christianity. What do I mean by that? Well, we'll start with the ideology and then we can kind of move outwards. Um, Roman Empire converts to Christianity in the 4th century. Um, why? Up till then, I mean, you know, I mean, Jesus, you read the kind of New Testament, um, there's a fair bit of anti-Roman rhetoric going on there, depending on which of the different Gospels you're reading. Basically got this kind of countercultural sort of hippie character wandering around the Holy Land, sort of preaching peace and saying that the poor are blessed. Um, and the Romans um, are by turns kind of upset by this and just baffled. Um, and you can't really see uh, a Roman emperor kind of 
sort of getting up one morning and thinking, yeah, you know, the poor are really blessed. I think, uh, I think they have the keys to heaven, really, and well, I'm shafted, aren't I? Um, so it, it seems very weird that a Roman emperor would want to adopt Christianity, and although I'm simplifying the story dramatically, um, the key point is that as the Roman Empire becomes more and more difficult to hold together ideologically, the idea of a religious system with one guy at the top becomes more and more attractive if you're trying to say, hey, I'm the Roman Emperor and I rule all this stuff and there's only one ruler and it is me and it should only be me. Um, the idea that what's happening on earth reflects what is happening in heaven and that the heavenly order ought to be reflected in how earth works is incredibly powerful and attractive to the powerful um, in the medieval world. Um, so that's the kind of a fundamental reason why the Roman Emperor um, adopted Christianity, a Roman Emperor, Constantine, adopted Christianity in the 4th century AD. So you can start to see how what is kind of in some ways very countercultural um, and um, subversive religion in um, the Roman world actually comes to be adopted, and you might even say subverted, but certainly changed by the powerful to make it into a, a state religion. Um, medieval Scandinavian chieftains trying to exert power over their neighbours can see the benefits of that kind of one guy at the top model. Um, so that's one thing that they're keen to adopt. But by the time that we're dealing with Scandinavians converting to Christianity, um, Christianity has really become the representative of Roman um, technologies and political institutions in Western Europe. Um, so the Roman Empire, as we, as we know it, is a kind of secular political engine, um, runs out of steam in about the 4th or 5th centuries, 5th or 6th centuries AD. Um, but a lot of its structures remain in the church. Things like um, taxation, hierarchies, where you've got bishops and um, priests and deacons and subdeacons and archbishops, um, uh, hierarchies and structures that allow you to kind of um, extend your power through a very wide network um, and centralise that power at the top. Um, it's a system which uh, facilitates things like tax collection. Um, Christianity is also very keen on literacy, partly for ideological reasons, a religion of the book, but also because it's adopted um, a late Roman uh, literate culture. Um, and so, and which is also very useful, things like tax collection, again. Um, also exerting power. I mean, uh, once you've got literacy, it's much easier to control history. Um, so you can see how powerful people would be quite keen on saying, oh, well, hang on, we could write down like stories about how cool my ancestors were, for example. And uh, once it's written down, it's much harder to sort of, for, for later generations to argue with. And I might say, well, my dad said it was kind of different from that. And you go, but look, I've got a primary source, comes from the time beat that. So literacy is very powerful, taxation is very powerful, um, orders, structures of hierarchy are very powerful political institutions, which medieval Scandinavian chieftains and latterly kings are really keen to get hold of. Um, and adopting Christianity is a way to get hold of all of those structures. I'm not saying that these people don't believe in God as well and, and think that he was really powerful and was in a good position to help them in battles and heal them when they were sick and, and, and do all sorts of other useful stuff. Um, they may even have had some humility and, and thought that the poor were blessed. Good luck to them, you know, that's, that's great. Um, but it's important to understand that there are lots and lots of other factors affecting why you'd want to adopt Christianity. And that's one reason why we can kind of perhaps say that Christianity is more a symptom than a cause of change. Um, if you've got people who are starting to kind of centralise power and, and doing that because they've kind of amassed wealth and prestige... Um, perhaps through Viking raids, perhaps through other activities, um, who are essentially medievalising an Iron Age society, taking what had been an Iron Age society and making it into a medieval society with kingdoms and kings um, and uh, a system whereby the son inherits the kingdom from the father. Um, all of those changes are going to kind of promote the adoption of Christianity, um, partly on its own terms at, as a kind of aspect of Europeanisation and other uh, another aspect of medievalization, um, uh, and also as a means to various kind of technologies and, and um, modes of power. Okay, that was a little bit of a ramble. Hopefully it was um, reasonably coherent. So we've got um, conversion to Christianity, also much subtler 
more complex process of or several many processes of Christianization, which involve things like adopting literacy, um, even if your intentions aren't actually particularly pious in doing so. Um, so yes, lots of different layers and themes going on there. Um, let's get back to my slides. Okay, so by about the 13th century, kingdoms have consolidated um, into Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. Um, what's now Finland is part of Sweden and had never really been anything else um, uh, apart from a bunch of tribes in a forest. Um, and eventually they sort of look up and they're like, oh, so we're ruled by uh, the king of Sweden, right, okay. Um, so you're getting this process going on and going in tandem with that, as I was explaining, is a process of trying to get bishops to match up or archbishops to match up with kingdoms. So at first, all of Scandinavia is actually under the Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen, um, who's, who was based down in North Germany, basically, right down at the bottom of uh, Denmark, south end of Denmark. Um, around 8, 845, uh, the Archbishop of Hamburg Bremen starts claiming authority over Scandinavia. Um, however, um, Denmark uh, is, is, is pretty kind of fast off the mark in getting an archbishopric of its own based at Lund. Um, confusingly, that's now in Sweden, it's here, but it was in Denmark at the time. Um, and so they, they managed to uh, wrest control from Hamburg Bremen, get their own archbishopric, so they're really pleased with that. That makes it a lot easier for them to kind of control their own ecclesiastical politics and for the king to kind of control what the church is doing. Um, and, and, and they get a double winner because uh, the Archbishop of Lund gets to control, in theory, all of Scandinavia. So the Dan Danes are really kind of ahead of their neighbours and feeling pretty smug at that point. Well, it obviously wasn't going to last. Um, so uh, by 1153 or 1154, um, Norway manages to get one too um, in Nidaros, or uh, what's now Trondheim up here. Um, and uh, smug old Norway, um, their archbishop is in charge of Iceland. Hello, that's going to kind of pretend some later events and places like the Faroes as well. So um, 1154, Iceland's, uh, sorry, Norway is, is, is in on the archbishop game. Uh, Sweden, not too long after, it takes them a little while. Um, but uh, Uppsala, which uh, you saw some pictures of earlier, manages to get its archbishop. And uh, he's not only in control of this region that we now think of um, as uh, the sort of central bit of Sweden, but also Orbu, um, which is now in Finland, um, Dorku in Finnish. Um, so, so he's got control over that eastern Baltic region. Um, okay, so politicking over bishop, bishops and bishoprics and archbishoprics has gone on. And uh, we arrive at a picture by the middle of the 12th century where you've got a set of kingdoms and they're all officially Christian and each kingdom has its own archbishop. So a key phase of medievalization has taken place um, and a key phase, of course, of Christianization. Bit chicken and egg, see what you think. Um, okay, uh, let's see, uh, see what I have next. Oh, I've just got some pictures. Um, there's Lund Cathedral. Um, there's Trondheim Cathedral. It's got a lot in common with Salisbury Cathedral, curiously. Um, a lot of the same masons involved. Um, and there's Uppsala Cathedral. Uh, you, oops, I apologise. There we go. Uppsala Cathedral. You saw the spire of the cathedral, um, if your resolution was good enough. Um, in my picture, taken from Uppsala, you saw it just poking up on the horizon. And uh, were your eyes incredibly good, which um, one can't expect them to be, uh, you would see the spire of the little church at, up, at Gamla Uppsala um, on the horizon here. So the big cathedral winds up very close to that earlier ritual site. Um, fine. Okay, so, so that's our kind of overall sort of trajectory of, of Christianisation, um, or at least conversion and, and, and sort of key institutions of Christianity in the region. Um, let's get Iceland into the story at this point, and then we'll kind of move on to some um, wider aspects of Scandinavian politics um, in the medieval period and then we can proceed finally to think about Icelandic literature. Okay, so 874 is the traditional and probably the correct date for the first Scandinavian settlement of Iceland. Um, we have that in a literary source, uh, Eastlendingabolk, which uh, I mentioned a little bit later here. Um, but it's corroborated reasonably well by archaeology, partly because 
um, volcanic eruptions on Iceland lay down layers of ash. Um, the eruptions themselves can be dated because the ash gets uh, preserved in ice in Greenlandic, in Greenlandic glaciers. So you can drill an ice core down through the glacier, um, count each year of ice that's been laid down a bit like tree rings, and therefore kind of count back for how many years. Well, basically for any layer, you can work out what year it was laid down in. Um, and then you can look at the chemical composition of that layer and find out what bits of ash were in the air at the time from Iceland. And then you can go and look at Iceland and find bits of ash laid down in the ground. And there's a, a layer of ash known as the Lundnalms layer, um, the layer of settlement under which no settlement has been found. Or, well, maybe some has, but, um, but it seems to have been around 874 that, that the settlement occurred. So we can corroborate that fairly well. Um, so firmly in the Viking Age, well before the conversion of, to Christianity of any of the uh, Scandinavian kingdoms, indeed before even any of the Scandinavian kingdoms as we know them had come into being, uh, still a period of political consolidation. Um, the reasons for the settlement um, are ones that we didn't go into here. Um, there's plenty of debate about what was going on. The later Icelandic story is that they were all forced out by the evil king, well, or problematic king Harald in Harfagri, Harald the nice-haired, um, who uh, consolidates power a little bit too much for certain people's liking and they all leave, but probably a lot of much more s complex reasons um, underlie the settlement of Iceland. We've, um, oh, let's get rid of that I, don't think that should be there. Um, we've got the adoption of Christianity, 999 stroke 1000, by the Althing, um, a thing is a meeting in Old Icelandic, and the Al thing is a meeting of everyone. Not actually everyone. It's often portrayed as kind of being a precursor to modern democracy. But um, the people who actually had any power were all men, and uh, they were all wealthy aristocrats. Slaves didn't get to participate, and there were lots of slaves, and so forth. So it's not really a democratic institution the way we would think of one. But there's no king on Iceland at this period. Um, the place is run by this kind of confederation of, of aristocrats who meet up um, now and again and have these great big meetings. Um, and, and at one of these meetings, Christianity is adopted. Um, it's a very kind of political sort of process that the Icelanders themselves find quite interesting and like to write about in the medieval period. Um, rather different from the kind of brutal converting kings who are just trying to, or mainly trying to use Christianity as a means of uh, consolidating and establishing their own power in a kingdom. Um, cool. A little bit later... Um, we have this guy, Ari in Frode, composing Islendinga Bok, um, the book of the Icelanders. And this may not be the very first thing written in Icelandic, but it seems to have been um, a seminal and early uh, composition in Icelandic. Um, and it's a, a short text, which just gives a, a little history of Iceland, as Ari understood it from his oral sources, um, his old relatives and so forth, um, about why and how Iceland was settled and um, why it converted to Christianity. Um, really interesting text. Um, lots of other stuff too, like um, how they established a calendar, how they established laws. Re really kind of striking uh, account of a process of colonisation and the formation of, of, a, of a working society. Um, sure, you'll have to take with a pinch of salt, but amazing document. And so from Ari and Frothi, we can kind of see ourselves um, coming into a period when Icelanders are writing literature, they're writing it in their own language, um, and, and, and that beginning that we see with Ari gains an awful lot of steam and momentum um, in the coming centuries. 1262, another key development, um, Iceland comes under Norwegian rule. We saw already that in the mid-12th century, um, Iceland had come under ecclesiastical rule from Norway, um, first step of Norwegian kings extending their power over Iceland. Um, perhaps in an, in, an innoc in an innocuous way at the time, who knows. Um, but um, in due course, by various complex kind of movements of politicking and so forth, um, Iceland basically comes into Norway and winds up being ruled by the Norwegian king. And, and after that, they really have quite a rough ride, and, um, in, and increasingly a rough ride um, into the 19th century, as, as various kind of imperial rulers basically kind of rip the country off dramatically. Um, rape the country, no less, um, you, you might say, um, depending on whose perspective you take slightly, but it's a really tough deal for Iceland, basically. Um, and um, 
it's in the 13th century that a lot of our classic sagas are composed. So in the decades leading up to Norway establishing its rule over Iceland and in the decades following. So that's roughly where Iceland is fitting in then chronologically to, the, to this story. Um, the story gets a bit more complicated again. Oh, just to yeah, emphasise uh, the old thing, there's a picture of um, the law rock, the Lögberg, um, where um, people used to stand um, to make speeches with a big cliff behind them to kind of reflect the sound forward. Um, the um, law speaker, um, a guy who was elected over a period of several years, um, to remember and recite the laws of the country would kind of stand there and, and, and do his thing. Um, I think I've got another picture of Thingvetlir. Oh yeah, let's just get this into a more um, sensible size. Uh, oops, that was the wrong direction. Um, Thingvetlir is a totally amazing place. Um, there's a big cliff um, that you saw in the previous slide. There's a cliff. Um, the picture's taken from standing on here. Um, and we start off looking in this direction. So we can see this cliff behind us. And, and this is actually between the North American and the Eurasian Oceanic Plates. Um, the big cliff is on the North American side. Oh, there's me, looking a bit stupid. Um, and uh, we're looking across to the Eurasian side. And you just get this amazing plain in between, crisscrossed with rivers, um, amazing deep fissures which just go down for tens of metres uh, with this incredibly blue, shining water. Um, a really kind of magical, powerful place. No wonder they chose it as a site for the Al thing. Um, and here we are back round, having moved 180 degrees and looking back round to the, the cliff. Um, really extraordinary sight. Um, cool. So, a place that had been ruled by this kind of bunch of aristocrats meeting at the Althing, uh, which did continue to exist, but with kind of atrophied powers, wound up under Norwegian rule in the 13th century, 1262. Um, a couple of hundred years, or 250 years after Christianity had officially been adopted. Okay, hopefully you're feeling reasonably with it, with this overall chronology then. A bunch of Vikings knocking around, um, from the 9th century to about, say, the 11th. Um, from about the 11th onwards, we're thinking much more in terms of kings, kingdoms, um, and medieval, um, a medieval world rather than an Iron Age world. Um, and conversion to Christianity kind of comes with that. Around the 9th century to the, um, well, sorry, 10th century to the um, 11th. Um, and um, with Christianity come various kind of political structures and also stru technologies like uh, manuscript writing, which are incredibly important for the production and sort of beginnings of medieval Icelandic and Scandinavian literature, which is what I'm going to be moving us on to next. Just check if I've got any more slides uh, in this uh, section. Um, oh, yes, I remember. OK, let's just uh, nail this. Um, just a quick sketch of what goes on up to the end of, more or less the end of the medieval period. Um, there's a sort of growing feeling in continental Scandinavia, and Iceland of course has no say at this point. We're, we're starting this story in the late 13th century, when Iceland's already under Norwegian rule. Um, there's a growing feeling that really kind of all the Scandinavian countries ought to be ruled by one person, so a kind of further extension of that sense of consolidation. And it does actually come about through a series of marriages, um, who have we got? Okay, Halkon, king of Norway. Um, he has a, um, a daughter who marries the son of the king of Sweden. Oh, okay, so Norway and Sweden wind up being ruled by this guy Magnus um, Eriksson, who gets to be first, um, well, gets to be the king of Norway uh, and Sweden until Sweden gets taken off him, and so he gets some toing and froing. Um, meanwhile, the, uh, ooh, the Danish line, um, Valdemar IV, king of Denmark, he has a daughter as well, who winds up marrying Halkon IV, son of Magnus. So Denmark and Norway are kind of being brought into alignment as well. Ooh, someone else has got Sweden over here, um, but his close relatives are actually kind of marrying into um, 
uh, various other Scandinavian lines. And so, yeah, how does this work? Um, by a series of kind of marriages and deaths and relationships, um, the, the kingship of all these places finally passed to Eric of Pomerania, a curiously hapless character, if I remember rightly, though that might not be fair, um, who sort of gains Norway in 1389, then kind of gains Denmark and Sweden as well. And of course, once it, with Norway, he had um, Iceland, then Denmark get Iceland um, and Norway. And, and, it, and so they're all kind of hanging together a bit. And it's called the Kalmar Union. It's the end of the narrative, basically. Kalmar being the name of the place where the treaty was signed. Um, so, so there is actually a period where all the Scandinavian countries do wind up kind of ruled by the same person. Uh, and that doesn't last. But um, for most of the period up to the 20th century, there are various kind of different situations with one country ruling another and Iceland remains under um, Danish rule. Um, Norway gets ruled by Sweden and by Denmark at different times. Uh, Sweden extends its power through various places in the Baltic. It's got Finland, um, Estonia, and Denmark have Estonia too at various points. So um, you can see these kind of overlapping power groups. Um, basically reflecting um, a medieval and much more integrated, politically integrated world, which Iceland has to kind of play itself off against in various different ways. Okay, and um, just to sort of uh, bring that to a close, um, oh, oh I, I've, I've obscured part of my, my nice picture of Tallinn, for which I apologise. Uh, Tallinn is uh, over here, um, etymologically the uh, castle of the Danes, um, so it's set up as a, a Danish trading uh, position um, on the route out of the Baltic and into the Oesterweger, the um, riverine routes down to the Black Sea. Um, from about the 14th century onwards, uh, you get a kind of, well, you get the Hanseatic League, um, which is basically a kind of um, trading cooperative of merchants who um, managed to, to establish a monopoly over pretty much all Baltic trade and quite a lot of other trade too. Iceland gets kind of systematically ripped off by the Hanseatic League. Um, so it's basically a bunch of merchants who, who are all in each other's pockets. Um, so not only have we got these political ties right through Scandinavia, but we've also got um, economic and trading ties right through the region too. And uh, Tallinn is particularly kind of beautiful and impressive example of a Hanseatic city, which you can only see a little bit of, so I apologise for that. Okay. Um, that's taken us then right through from the Viking Age to more or less the end of the Middle Ages, and it's given you hopefully a rough sense of the sort of trajectories and changes that are going on in the region. Um, and roughly, hopefully, how Iceland fits into that. And I hope you've also got a sense from, from this particular section of how Christianity and literacy um, were related to wider changes in society um, and um, royal power. Um, just, just, just roughly. All right, cool. Um, one more section to go, which will be on the subject of the sagas themselves. Um, so, hope you're all right for that. Not too knackered. Um, see you in a minute for more brilliant saga action. Um, bye for now.